so I'm Maddie and I'm Tim and we founded Permaculture Magazine and this year it's the 25th anniversary since our first edition in 1992. What are your earliest memories of being in the garden? In life like when we were babies? Oh lovely mm. question. Um, my earliest memory is going down to the bottom of the garden in London, which was a suburban garden, so it was reasonably long, and it felt huge because I was tiny, and looking up at a cherry tree and seeing it covered with cherries, and then later on being able to eat some, and thinking that was just wonderful. We had some mature apple trees in our garden um, and I remember hiding in them from my parents. I once hid for an hour and a half and I could hear them saying, where's Tim? And I think, I'm in the apple tree <laughs> and I'm not telling you. <laughs> How did you both become involved in permaculture? Ah, I saw a programme on uh, Channel 4 called In Grave Danger of Falling Food, uh, about Bill Mollison and the Permaculture Principle. And it completely blew my mind. I blew a fuse. Um, I sent off the information pack. Out fell a little leaflet about, about a forest, garden, uh, forest gardening course um, with a visit to Robert Hart's Forest Garden in Shropshire. And um, one of the teachers was Patrick Whitefield, who became a very good friend and one of our authors, and uh, was the very first mentor to us with Permaculture Magazine. And me, well, his mind was blown, and for a while I was very resistant and thought, I'm not sure I want to do this. Um, but I began, to, we, we were really interested in conservation and we'd started planting a wildflower meadow and we had a conservation garden and I'd done conservation volunteering and it just seemed like a logical progression to have a, a, a nature reserve in your garden but also to have food for humans as well as animals and birds so it, it arose naturally from there. How involved have your children been in your garden and home and how have they responded as they've grown um, to how you've approached life? Well, we've n we n have never pushed permaculture on them, um, hoping that they would pick it up osmotically and um, that's pretty much what has happened. I mean, they're very environmentally and socially conscious people, but they kind of arrived at it in their own time, in their own way. They've both done permaculture design courses, but when they were adults, not when they were children. Um, they both learnt to cook quite young, and they both learnt to forage when they were really tiny babies. So they, they would go out and, and pick you know, strawberries and Broccoli beans spears. and all sorts of things, and just forage through, through the forest garden and the vegetable plot. Um, when they were teenagers, I think they went through a period where they thought it was a bit boring, really, and they wanted, you know, they wanted certain things that their their peers wanted. I mean, that's really natural to kick back and rebel against. Um, but as soon as they became young adults, they just totally saw the wisdom of it, um, and they've developed their own interests and their own careers. But as Tim says, they're very environmentally and socially switched on um, they've got they've got they've got really good ethics about life and people and the planet what is your biggest permaculture success God. how do you quantify that uh, um well, there have been a few. <laughs> I don't, uh, it's don't, hard, don't, isn't it? I yeah, for, it for me, for me, for me, it's the public publishing of Patrick Whitefield's Earth Care Manual, four hundred and fifty plus pages of permaculture design course um, in one book. It took Patrick eight years to write, 
and it took me two years to design it in cooperation with him. Um, it was an immense effort. It still um, sells incredibly well, so um, um, I would think that would probably be our finest effort. But also, so is just being in existence as a magazine in these very, very precarious times in um, the magazine in industry, um, having published 93 issues. And, you know, having done things like People and Permaculture, the first book about people care in the world um, in relationship to permaculture design, Aranya's Permaculture Design Step by Step that's now published in Spanish by a mainstream publisher that will go not only to Spain but all, all over South America. Um, permaculture in a Nutshell, Patrick's first book, has sold how many copies? 15 or 15,000 or more copies being translated into eight different languages. It's just gone into Chinese. Yeah. So, it's, so it's hard. I think probably our publishing work has been the work that's gone out in a very global way. But, but you know, it's not all about like numbers of books sold. Um, so it's hard to quantify. So how, far, how far all this information goes? It goes all around the world. And that ultimately is actually yeah. our greatest success. But I'm quite happy about the fact that we've, we've changed a bare arable field into a, a really biodiverse garden. And the fact that, you know, we have lizards in the garden, which are common lizards, but they're not common in Hampshire. So what's your favourite plant in the forest garden? <laughs> oh, there, there, there are a few. Um, I'm particularly fond, though, of my Nepalese pepper tree, um, which produces copious amounts of, of peppers. It's a beautiful tree in its own right. Um, and um, when the fruit get ripe, it's just the tree becomes a blaze of red. Yeah. So it's a very cool tree. But there are others. Yeah. Who have been your personal inspirations? Oh, I, you know, I've just written a book called Fertile Edges and the index has just come in and I looked at it this morning for the first time and it, it indexes everyone I mention in, in all of the essays in the book over 20 years. And I noticed that, I noticed who I mention most. So. It's obvious that Bill Mollison's going to have been a huge influence on our lives. Um, but I notice also that I mentioned Joanna Macy, the Buddhist scholar and person who um, originated the work that reconnects, which is all about getting people to really engage with environmental crisis and, and climate change, but also design um, pathways out of despair and into being activated and engaged. So not just to think, oh my god, the world's awful, let's just shut off and go down the pub and forget about it. Um, but to actually per make their lives purposeful. So she's been a really big in influence for me. Um, we've had many influence. Patrick Whitefield was a, a, a huge mentor for both of us as yeah a permaculture practitioner, a teacher, and someone that we worked with very, very closely for many, many years. Mm. So I would Definitely. put him as very high up in, mm. in the echelons of influence. I, 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 th I think he, he more than anyone helped us get going, and he held us together, and he... He, he taught was, us permaculture. He, he taught us permaculture. Yeah. And he was just a, an immensely good friend. And we taught him how to write books. But which one book has changed your lives more than any other? I don't think I could name just one book in, in that sort of category. I think because I'm a person that synthesises information from lots of different places and disciplines and perspectives, um, there have been many books on my journey that have helped me to develop my worldview and and who I am and, and how I've personally developed my permaculture thinking. I've recently read a book called Sapiens. I can't remember the name of the author apart from that. In fact, he's got 
the name Noah in it. But that's a very, very profound book about the human condition and how we got here. Um, I, I would also say that, like, I think one of my influences has been John's, the book um, Think Like a Mountain that, that John Seed and, and, and Joanna Macy and others wrote, which is about sort of ecological activism and, and how, you know, to empower yourself so that you don't feel like a, you know, hopeless little person in, mm. in, a, in a big machine. So that's one of the, but obviously, you know, Patrick's books mm. have been really influential, um, Aranya's, mm. the writings of Bill Mollison, all these people, Luby's work with, with People Care, you know, all our authors, and, and Charles Darding's had a huge influence in How We Grow Veg mm. and, yeah, and so. Zeph Hafferty. So, so every author we've worked with, um, Glennie Kindred, about reconnecting with um, wild spaces and plants. All, all our authors have, have been our teachers and it's been very much a two-way exchange between Well, we've always published the things publishing. that we wanted to know about. <laughs> so, <laughs> sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, really. So what has kept you going for a quarter of a century in permaculture publishing? Bloody-mindedness. Uh, bloody um, a bit of stupidity. Um, I would call, I'd reframe, reframe that. that. I'd call it naivety. Naivety. We you had know. no idea it was going to be this difficult, which is a good thing, because if we did, if we knew it was going to be this difficult, then we wouldn't have done it. And a, a totally enduring and perhaps verging on the obsessive desire mm. to create a, a really tangible, practical vision of what the world could look like if it was permacultured and what the world would look like if we really lived our life in accordance with earth care, people care and fair shares. Quite. It would be an amazing, beautiful, regenerative, healed planet yep. and people would live far more creative and beautiful lives. So when you were first starting out, do you think some things would have moved quicker than they have? And are we getting there, or do we need more promoting, more education, more activists, more people doing? All of those things. Yeah. I mean, we, we, still we, need we it. seriously, being optimistic, thought we were going to crack it, didn't we? Yeah. We were pretty convinced that by now the BBC would be doing, you know, permaculture how to's every week. And to a certain extent, it comes into a bit of gardening but on the <clears throat> social change level particularly the UK and particularly England is way way behind other countries in Europe and in the rest of the world and I think we've gone backwards so yeah more doers you, you say that I mean generally across the the, um, I meant the, the, the populace and politically that is perhaps the case but there is more far more social and permacultural action going on than perhaps in some ways we might have imagined there would be. So but we need more. But we need more. And we need it to be un we we need it not to be a club mm. or even a tribe. We need permaculture just to be normal. Absolutely normal common sense of how we live on this planet. And in your adventure in a way and journey to get there, you've met so many um, such a wide range of people and what's your favourite aspect of working with so many different people from across the planet? Um, the inspiration never stops. You're always seeing some something new, some project or some person who is using permaculture in a way that you'd never dreamed you'd see and that is very inspiring. Every magazine we do has new stuff in it, new new ideas, new projects, and we feel very privileged to be um, be a core hub of permaculture information because it just feeds us. And, and actually answering the previous question is that's probably what keeps us going, is that we're just always being fed new, brilliant ideas. 
And what's the hardest aspect or are there any challenges of working with so many different people? <laughs> people can be <laughs> you have difficult. <one> last week. <laughs> people can be very cross. Um, and pe some people have a very strong agenda, which is all about them. And so, you know, there are times where it's difficult. I think it's very difficult in a society that is so brainwashed by advertising and product generated commercialism um, to actually communicate up permaculture ideas which are fundamentally about reducing consumption, about becoming more self-reliant, about buying less, making more, deepening friendships, being more in your community and, it, and it's it, we're we're swimming against the tide of, you know, the, the current model of commerce and and society, um, and it's it's difficult to sustain the energy when you're always swimming against the tide. But then you have you get tired, and then someone comes along and says, "I'm going to give you a hand," and and just just boosts your energy and you swim better for a while and that happens to us a lot, we're very lucky. And what's the most important lesson life has taught you? Be humble. And what makes you happiest? <laughs> Nature. Yeah. And friendships. Hmm. And family. And, and wilderness. Um, where do you see the next 10 years going? In, in your lives and with the future of permaculture? Okay, I think in our lives I see very much the next generation stepping in and being so. at the real <laughs> front line of publishing. I see, I hope, I see myself writing more, um, gardening more, um, sharing information with people face to face more because I've spent 25 years in quite a digital environment, um, increasingly so with computers. Um, and permaculture generally, I, I think as this whole social unravelling caused by austerity and the inequalities in our society bites harder and harder and harder, I hope um, that the network of permaculture activists are going to be able to step up their influence to help people get through with really practical skills about building community, growing food, being more um, independent from the um, big six energy companies, all, all those kind of things that really deeply worry people and that they need um, new knowledge, new skills and reassurance that there are other ways of living um, that will free them. Perfect, thank you very much.